Mark chapter 8. And you follow this with me if you've got a Bible. Mark chapter 8, starting at verse 14. If you need a Bible, there are some on the, the table at the back. And if you're using one of these church Bibles, page 999. So Mark chapter 8 and starting at verse 14. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it's because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see Or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? They came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on him, on the man's eyes, and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't go into the village. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Well, you turn with me then back to Mark chapter 8 and this section, verse 22 through to 26. There's a video, and I'm sure lots and lots of you have seen it, of uh, a South African man who parks his ute in the, in the bush and starts, he gets out of his car and starts calling a name, and, and suddenly this lion comes bounding out of the scrub, and, and you're looking at this scene and you're thinking, oh, I know exactly what's going to happen, this man's going to get torn to shreds, and, and then the lion does something totally unexpected and puts these great paws on his shoulders and just starts licking his face. This lion was a pet. <coughs> for years and years and still remembered its master's voice. In verse 22, Jesus and the disciples arrive in Bethsaida and they're met by people whose friend is blind. Jesus takes the blind man aside. He finds a a quiet spot. Everything seems to be following the same pattern that we've seen Jesus do time and time again. We know what's going to happen, but then Jesus does something totally unexpected. At first glance, it looks like the miracle hasn't worked. It needs a second try. And so we ask, what on earth is happening here? Is Jesus weakening? Has the unbelief of the Pharisees and the, the slowness of his disciples finally made a reduction on Jesus' power? Well, we can't believe that. Jesus' power depends on no one. Lazarus was no help. When Jesus brought him back from the dead, the disciples were were all a panic when he stilled the the storm and the crowd were jeering and mocking when he took their sin on himself and died on the cross to save us from hell. Jesus' power isn't limited by anything. And so that means that Jesus must have healed in this two-step way on purpose. And so this morning we want to ask, why? 
I've got three answers. And the first is for the blind man. That's why Jesus healed in this way, for that man. And I want you to see three G's. The first G is that this is a generous healing. I'm looking at verse 22 and 23. You remember how Jesus dealt with that deaf mute in chapter 7? How he mimed out the healing, meeting the needs of, of that disabled man who couldn't hear or speak. And so again, the compassionate Lord Jesus is helping this man in a way that he understands. You think about how important touch is to a blind person. He'd spent his life feeling his way through the darkness. His only way of learning independently was touch. And that's exactly where Jesus meets this man. Mark tells us four times he mentions the word touch. It's a close personal encounter on his level. He can hear Jesus as he spits and he feels the spittle on his eyes. It's, it seems so gross to us, but in a culture where people greet each other with a kiss, they're used to spittle. It's not that strange. And what better way of showing a man that the, the power to help him comes from inside Jesus? Jesus could have healed him with a, a wave of a hand or any other silent way that this man wouldn't have known about, but this is the generous Savior who meets needy people exactly where they need him most. Then I want you to see that it's a gentle healing, verse 24 to 25. In the morning, I'm usually up before Sarah and I pull back the curtains and she squirms and she holds the duvet over her head. How much harder for this man? Having been for years in pitch blackness to go to all of the, the light and the color of the Middle Eastern day. Jesus is gentle with this man. There's a, a transition, an opportunity to acclimatize. Not too much light. There's still a blurriness, a haze. And we don't want to make too much of that because, well, other people seem to have been given their sight immediately. But there's a, a gentleness in the transition here. Thirdly, I want you to see that it's godly, the way that Jesus deals with him. Looking at verse 25 and 26. Jeffrey Ross was telling us that when he was in Cambodia, they could give a skipping rope to a child and they would just be dumbstruck by their generosity. You see, if you have nothing, well then the smallest gift is amazing. This man's vision had been partly restored. There was light where there'd been darkness. There was color where there'd only been black. He saw blurred, moving shapes of people looking a bit like trees. Don't think for one second that he was disappointed with that. He would be ecstatic. There was vision where there had been total blackness. Now perhaps a good doctor today could manage that. If he operated with a laser, perhaps a, a top surgeon could restore a little bit of sight. But Jesus is so much more than just a doctor. He's the God who created human eyes in all their complexity and beauty. And he hasn't finished with this man yet. A man who's completely blind leaves with perfect vision. Jesus heals him with godly power and then he commands him with godly authority. Verse 26, don't go into the village, go home. Don't go into the town before you run around looking at all the things that you've been aching to see. Go and reflect. Go and fix your eyes on what's just happened before you stir up the crowd and make it difficult for me to be here. Find a, a quiet spot. Think about who Isaiah said would open the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf and make the lame jump and the dumb speak. This miracle is not just a great act of love from Jesus doing something kind and generous to this man, but it's a great revelation of who he is. Who else could open his eyes but the God who made eyes? Secondly, I want you to see Jesus healed in this way for his disciples. I had to have an operation on my hand. I'd broken my hand and a couple of bones in my finger. And there were a couple of anaesthetists. They had to put my arm to sleep. And one was a trainee and she was watching the other doctor as she worked. And this doctor was brilliant. 
didn't feel a, a thing. Just this big long needle going into my shoulder and, and didn't feel a thing. And then she looked at me and she said, would you mind if this other doctor finished the, the, the anesthetic? And I said, okay. And she jabbed <laughs> and she prodded and she poked. And I was incredibly glad that the arm was already half asleep. Now who benefited? Both of us. We both did. I needed my arm to be asleep, otherwise surgery would be agony and she needed to learn. When I say that Jesus healed in this way for his disciples, I don't want you to think that he was cruel to the blind man in any way. This experience was all joy for him. It was all for his benefit. But it was also especially for the benefit of Jesus' disciples. You see, in this healing, Jesus is giving the disciples a physical parable to show what was happening to them at a spiritual level. Those of you who have been here for weeks and weeks, you think about what's been happening in Jesus' ministry. He's performing mighty miracles. He's teaching people with authority, not like the religious leaders. People who are, are blind to God are catching a glimpse of something that they've never seen before. They could sense that there was something special about this man, Jesus. So they came in their crowds to hear him speak. They knew that he had something to do with God. But they didn't see that he was God, made flesh. They couldn't grasp that he was the Messiah come to save them from sin and hell. Everything is blurry and unclear. And so they say, well, he, he's, he's John the Baptist back from the dead. Or he's a prophet like one of the prophets of old. They understand something, but they don't see it clearly. Now the disciples are in the same place. They're closer to Jesus than anyone. They've had behind the scenes access and he's explained everything to them, but they still don't get it. It's all hazy. Only one verse before our text. Jesus is asking them, do you still not understand? Is everything still blurry and obscure? Then a blind man's brought to Jesus. And he takes the opportunity to show them what is happening in their hearts. He takes spittle from his mouth. Follow this with me. He takes spittle from his mouth and touches those blind eyes which are in total darkness. And they start to see. And so the words of Christ, that's what that spittle represents. The words of Christ, they come with power and they filter through the, the minds of the hearers down into their hearts. And those hearts that were spiritually dead, that had nothing of life about them, that were hard and callous, start to twitch. There's something going on. It's not saving faith, but a tremor. They can see something, but it's blurry. These spiritual realities that are, are suddenly open to them, they're like trees walking around. It's just not right. It's uncertain and blurry. So Jesus touches the man again. He doesn't try a different technique. It's nothing new. It's the same word of God applied to those dead hearts. But this time, they're revived. The heart comes to life. And everything that was hazy becomes crystal clear. You see that happening with Peter, don't you? You see exactly the same process going on. He, he hears Jesus. He sees the miracles. But he still can't grasp spiritual truth. Beware, Peter, of the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. <laughs> it's because I forgot to bring bread, isn't it? No, what are you talking about bread for? Do you still not get it? Some more teaching more explanation, more of God's word falling on Peter's heart, more sowing and sowing of that seed until finally the seed takes root. Life breaks out, verse 29. But what about you, Peter? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. He's there. There's life. You see, Jesus is showing his disciples exactly what's happening in their hearts. And then thirdly, Jesus heals in this way for, for us. 
He does it for me and you. The final reason Jesus dealt with this man in this way was so that you might benefit this morning. Do you think about the Bible like that? It was written with you in mind. You know, Mark never knew that you would exist. But the Holy Spirit who inspired Mark, who brought passages and stories to mind, he's God. And he knew exactly what you would need to hear today. Three C's. First of all, this passage is showing us that there is real confidence for sinners. You see, there are two kinds of people here this morning. Those who love the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior, and those who don't. There's no other place for you to be this morning. There's no fence for you to sit on between heaven and hell. Either you've repented, believed, and your sin has been removed from you by the Lord Jesus, or you're still bound to sin, and heaven's doors are barred to you. I think a tyrant chains up his slaves and blindfolds them so they can't escape, and that's exactly what sin has done to all of us. We're headed for hell, helpless to do anything about it, but I'm saying there's confidence for you this morning because just as Jesus saved this man in his blindness so he can pierce the spiritual darkness that you are in he can break the chains and, and open your eyes won't you call out to him look at how tender he is dealing with this man this morning he's the generous gentle godly saviour of men don't miss your chance to deal with him the second C is that there's a challenge. And it's a challenge to the partially sighted. I once preached in a church and a man came up to me afterwards and he thanked me and thanked me and thanked me for the preaching and he said, I just love this church so much. I drive an hour to get to church. I drive an hour home. I drive an hour back for the evening service and drive an hour home every Sunday. I just love it. And I mentioned him to my host over the dinner table and he said, yeah, that man's not a Christian. I was like, what? He said, it's not a Christian. He doesn't believe that Jesus is God. He comes every week. He's one of the most dedicated people here. But he doesn't believe Jesus is God. Now, there are churches full of people like that. And I don't doubt that there are some here this morning. You see something in Jesus. There's something about him that gets you interested. Something attractive about Christ and the wholesome life that his people live. You enjoy singing the hymns and songs and you enjoy discussing spiritual truth. You call yourself a Christian, but everything is still hazy and unclear. You see people, but they're like trees walking around. You understand many things, but it doesn't affect your heart. You understand Jesus is God, but your life doesn't change. You listen to preaching and it moves you, but you go home and nothing changes. Wake up! Do you not see how close to hell you are? You're on the same road as Judas. And thousands since whose eyes have never truly been opened, whose souls have never truly been saved. You ask, well, what must I do? Well, you must pray. Judas never saw clearly, but Peter did. Verse 29, you are the Christ. How did Peter see? What did Peter have? Well, Matthew 16, 17 gives us the answer. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. You see, because God's opened your eyes. And so here is your challenge this morning. If you hear God speaking to you, don't harden your heart, but pray, God, soften my heart and open my eyes. Show me who Jesus really is. The third C is a call to Bible preaching. 
The patient's rushed into the emergency room and while they're there, the heart stops. And so the doctor grabs the defibrillator, he charges the pads, he shouts clear and he zaps the man. No response. So he puts down the defibrillator and starts singing. The nurse says, what are you doing? And the doctor says, well, that didn't really work, did it? So I thought I'd try something else. Ridiculous. You'd say, you're a moron. You shouldn't be practicing medicine. Get out. And yet churches all over New Zealand are doing exactly the same thing right now. They try preaching. But it hasn't worked. So we'll, we'll try something else. We'll try some healing rallies. We'll try some just worship services. We'll just leave the preaching out. That's the bit that offends people. We'll gear our worship towards just the young people. Everything can be focused on them. We'll have coffee during the sermon. We'll avoid saying bad words like sin and hell and judgment. They specialize in giving people just enough light. Just enough truth that they can see something, but it always stays blurry and uncertain. Why have they done this? Because preaching didn't give instant results. And that's all we want today, isn't it? We want what we want, and we want it now. And if it doesn't give it us now, we'll find another way of getting it. But isn't this passage so clearly saying to us that the greatest sermons that were ever preached didn't yield instant results? That when God spoke to man, even to his 12 closest men and explained everything to them, they were not immediately converted and some never were. So did Jesus stop? Did he find a new way? Did he try something else? Did he put the spittle of God's word on their eyes once and then try something else? No, because Jesus knew that the only hope for sinners was the preached word of God. That's the method he's given, the one method that he's given, his one normal way of saving people. God's word preached faithfully, taken by the Spirit, made powerful in the hearts of men. George told us at camp he had heard the gospel hundreds of times and he saw something of the, the majesty and the beauty of the Lord Jesus and then he paid a penny for a tract and he read the same old gospel he had heard before time and time again. But this time his eyes were opened. And many of you have similar testimonies. How lost would we be if we only heard this gospel once? So come on, church. We shake off these expectations of instant results. We're in this for the long run. It's a marathon that we're in together. You pray for those results or you pray for revival. But you remember revival. That's God's special way of dealing with this world, dealing with his church. His normal work is the constant, obedient witness and preaching of his people. You pray for revival and you keep praying and then you keep praying when it doesn't come. And you keep praying when the preaching gets a bit tougher and when, when things get a bit slow. You don't despise the day of small things, but you keep on praying. And you praise God for his faithfulness. We don't have a promise of instant results, but there's a promise of results. Jesus has said, I'll build my church. And his great method of building is the preaching of his gospel.